And hello, car lovers, and welcome to the CNC Auto Show. And I am Aaron Clements. I'm John Ryan. And we are here because we would love to share some information with you. And our goal is to give you information on ways to make your car, truck, or SUV safer, to make it more dependable, and to make it last longer for less money and less hassle. And this show will be slightly different today. It's the Power Hour Show, and it's filled with frequently asked questions and answers. Uh, these are some of the questions that we've been getting on email. We, uh, we will, people come into the shops and ask these questions right. and different situations. And we've put a list of these together. And with this list, we have, uh, we have compiled uh, all of these questions together. And we plan to ask them uh, or answer these questions reasonably fast each time and move straight on to the next question. So we'll be covering a lot of information on today's show, so we want you to buckle up and hold on real tight, and you can still watch this show live. Oh, I did need to mention that. <laughs> There's going to be some markets that won't be playing this show live. Right. Uh, you can still watch this show live on Facebook and uh, if, you, if you'd like. And also, you can uh, go to our YouTube channel to see a lot of the past videos also. That's right. Now, remember that if you're looking for a good, dependable repair facility almost anywhere in our beautiful country, just go to NapaAutoCare.com. That's NapaAutoCare.com. Whether you're on the road or you want to build a relationship uh, where you live, that's the place to go to find a good, dependable repair facility. Now, before we go to uh, fire this show off and go to our first question, I want to mention a few things that we'll be doing, and that's that Sherry Moxley will be asking the questions. Mm -hmm. John Ryan and I will be uh, sharing an answer, and then, boom, we'll go straight to the next one. And, John Ryan, are we ready to crank her up? Yeah, let's crank it up. Aaron. All right, here we go. I think you have gone to enjoy cranking that particular one up. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's the Chevy Diesel, right? Yep, it is. Yeah, I thought you did. Okay. Sherry, are we ready to go to the question? Of course we are. Okay. So the first question is, how often should I change my oil? Okay. When the engine stops running. Yeah. That's <laughs> what some people do. <laughs> they do, no doubt. Some of them think it's just something you just run until it goes out, don't they? Yeah. they. Uh, you do run into that sometime. Now, we'll say the majority of the people do very well they on do. taking care of their car. Just but I don't think some people have ever experienced the heartache or have any idea what right. the heartache is when you go involved in it yeah. well over the oil change because once exactly. the vehicle starts making that little knocky noise it's always it's too late there. Yep. you can't put metal back the a lot of people think you can put it in reverse and you know get that noise back yeah. out of there but Won't that's work. not the case either yeah. so so but in short i i would say that uh one of the most common things used to be three months three thousand miles that's what everybody said on on an oil change yeah but of course that's changed a lot over the years i now. would say up up to about 2010 ish is um, kind of when some of the uh longer intervals came out uh in the beginning it was mm -hmm. five months five thousand some yeah. vehicles all the way up to uh, ten thousand miles so mm -hmm. it kind of depends on, on on the vehicle the type of oil that it takes and of course what your owner's manual says also exactly and and i don't think very many later model vehicles are under the five thousand mile range Correct. yeah uh the majority of those and and just a little side note on that if your vehicle does take uh, full synthetic oil, you want to use the full synthetic oil, That's just right. like it says. If it does not say that you need it, right. uh, most commonly you do absolutely fine with the semi-synthetic blend oil. That's right. um, and also, as we're covering the oil change, just real quickly, uh, that's also the time that you should have your tire pressure checked that's uh, correct. and all the fluids checked. And find out if anything's due on the ve <coughs> vehicle right. if also. the tires need rotated. Yeah, so anything that's, that might be coming due. That's the only downfall that I don't personally like about the extended intervals. Mm -hmm. A lot of issues can come up on a vehicle, uh, say if it has 100,000 miles and you're going 10,000 mile intervals. Uh, you know, say if the brakes were needed at, at 2,000 yeah. miles and then you drive, uh, you know, 10. So the inspection to me, it's a good idea to get an inspection somewhere in between the 10,000, you know, maybe yeah. 5,000 miles. Uh, just a simple, you know, vehicle inspection, brakes, hoses, you know, fluids, mm -hmm. just like you mentioned. So yeah, Exactly. Okay, we are ready for the next question. Okay, well, this certainly wouldn't apply to me, but for some people, they want to know what if they don't drive their car very much? 
what yeah, about changing the oil. I think you the wheels off yours. I do. Well, I'll mention what we do uh, <laughs> it, it, as a regular basis because we do have a lot of customers that do that. Some customers retired, right, and they just uh, don't just plain don't drive very much right now unless they're going on a longer trip somewhere. Yeah. But what we normally do is let's say that if their oil change was coming due in five months, mm-hmm. but they hadn't been but say a thousand miles, uh, we ask them in that somewhere between three and five months, still come by the shop. Yeah. Still let us check all your fluid levels. Still let us check your tire pressure. Yes. Uh, look the car over. There's normally no charge for that That's to right. do that. And then go ahead and drive the car another 5,000 miles if right. I- if you don't go over the number of miles you're going. But go ahead and drive the car another five months, rather. Yeah. And then after that next five months, go ahead and change it either way. Regardless. And, of course, if the schedule is on 3,000 miles, I would do the same thing with the right. three months, 3,000. Uh, in six months, change it either way, whether Regardless, it's yep. do or not. And and I, I agree. Uh, I, of course, I have a vehicle that I don't drive all the time, but I always try and find a specific purpose, typically that I, you know, need it for, you know, once a week. Say it may be going to the grocery store. Well, no, that's I don't go to the grocery store. That's a lie. Like, say Lowe's. <laughs> you know, so specifically use that vehicle for only Lowe's or whatever it may be. That way you have a, a reason to drive it. It keeps it. Uh-huh. Of course, uh, you know, like you mentioned, the upper end lubricated, the seals from, you know, dry rot, that the is tires from point. flat square, yeah. you know. Even if you're not driving it much, you still need to get it up to operating temperature That's right, yeah. uh, for about 30 minutes. Because you can do just as much harm by cranking it up, mm-hmm. shutting it back off, just yes. like that, so... So that's for cars that are not driven very much. Okay, next question. Okay, what should the tire pressure be on my car? Oh, that is a good question. We get that a lot. We Um, do. Uh Especially, uh, you know, shops that that see so many different cars with different tires, different rim sizes. Uh, But the the answer to that question is actually in the vehicle. Uh, 90% uh, of vehicles, of course, there's a placard on the inside of the door pillar, normally the driver's door. Sometimes you see them in the glove box, Mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, the major majority of them is going to be in the door pillar. And it will say, you know, your tire size. Sometimes vehicles come with different tire sizes, so it'll have Mm -hmm. two, three listed, whatever's available. And then it'll have the recommended tire pressure. Um, The reason that's important is simply because a lot of them have tire pressure monitors. Mm -hmm. And that pressure that the uh, electronic system is looking for is specifically placed on that door placard. uh, Because in some vehicles, they're so sensitive. If it's one PSI below or one PSI above, Mm -hmm. it will set that light, trigger the light. So. Yeah, and so, uh, and, and a lot of times the pressure will change. So if your tire pressure uh, is is good in right. the summertime, then as the temperature dropped, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, a, a pound and a half of yeah, pressure for every 10 degrees yeah. in That's temperature right. yep. that we drop. So your tire pressure will change naturally, and also it will permeate through the tires just a little bit. So right. that's the reason uh, about once a month it's a good idea to have your tire pressure checked. It is, yeah. And, and make sure, and that's one of the best things that you can do to keep your gas mileage good and to make your tires last a lot longer also. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, sometimes people may vary just a few pounds up or down. It just depends uh, on what they're trying to achieve. You know, <coughs> if they're trying to get squeeze the every bit of economy, they may go up a little bit. Yeah. They want a little bit better ride. They may decrease yeah. them a little bit. But, but you kind of want to do, uh, you know, everything uh, kind of in the happy medium. You don't want to put so low that it rides great, but the tires are being worn on the sidewall. And, and the then also if you've got some tires that seem to be wearing, let's say, on the outside edge, on each outside edge and your alignment is in good condition, yeah. uh, then you may decide to add just a little bit of tire mm-hmm. uh, it, pressure so that you uh, even so wear a little bit more in the middle right. to get your – so you can talk to your service advisor when you carry your car in and just mention to the service advisor that uh, are the tires wearing okay, should you increase or decrease your tire pressure uh, just a little bit in any way to make sure. And as we're talking about tire pressure, just before we go into the break, I think it's a good idea to remember your part having to do with your uh, the part having to do with your spare tire. Yes, and sir, uh, right. don't forget to check the tire pressure on your spare tire. Okay, are we ready to go to the next question? No, actually, we're running out of time, time, time Oh, we are. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, all right, we're gonna go into the first break. And, uh, and we'll be right back and answer a lot more questions just after this. Three, two, Kevin Clements and John one. Ryan Mooney. Y'all are up. Stretch my feet out to the pedals. Smiling like a hero that just received his medal. It was just an old hand-me-down Ford with three speed on the 
Welcome back to the CNC Auto Show. Our, we are in our power hour. We are answering questions, and these are frequently asked questions that we receive by email or telephone or just people coming in and asking. And we have made a list of them, and we are answering them today. And Sherry Moxley is asking the questions, and Sherry, we are ready. Okay, Aaron and JR, our listeners want to know, how often should I check my antifreeze? Oh, I think that's a great question. Yes, it is. Uh, I think, you know, it kind of depends on the vehicle. Um, I think an older vehicle, typically, you know, the, the antifreeze has been changed. Sometimes rust, sediment can be built up in the engine. Um, so it really is it's, it's a good idea to check that quite frequently. Simply, you know, and of course it depends on how much you drive that vehicle, too. Um, what would you say about new cars, Aaron? The new, new coolant's changed well, a lot over the past. Well, what I'm is a lot of the new coolant, you're not introducing any, uh, any air into the system. It's pretty much a seal unit. It's not unusual the see the antifreeze last uh, about three years now of course right. i would check the the, the condition, condition and the level during every service right. and of course on a later model vehicle that's probably five out five months five thousand miles on most vehicles but check it each time the vehicle service yeah. make sure that it looks good and, and tests good right uh, but then i would recommend changing it uh, on a newer car, somewhere between three and four years. Mm -hmm. uh, but then after that, at least every two to three years after that. That's right. And then as the car gets a little older, you might want to bring that on down to every two years. Right. Keep uh, on reason. there because it, they tend to have some uh, leakage, introduction of oxygen, and that's what causes the corrosion. Right. And, of course, over a period of time, the antifreeze does lose its ability or its additives right. uh, that, are, that are in there to prevent corrosion. And, of course... You always want to before the uh, before the cold weather sets in, have someone check the antifreeze and make sure that you have a protection level that's good for the environment that you're going to. For instance, you don't want to be here uh, in 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 the south area, right? And uh, and say, well, the temperature will probably get down to maybe uh, 20 degrees, and yeah. you'll be good till 20, and then you decide to go snow skiing uh, <laughs> somewhere that negative the temperature going to get down yeah. to negative 20, right. and you have major engine problems. So right. have it checked for the place that you will be going to during your travels, and I recommend either way keeping a good protection level somewhere around 20 below zero. I agree, yeah. And another tip, too, uh, of course, there's a lot of coolants out there that are universal and generic. But mm -hmm. you want to be absolutely sure it specifically meets your coolant yes. needs. Uh, most owners' manuals will give a specification of what kind of coolant your vehicle takes, mm -hmm. and and the generic's fine as long as it does meet those same specifications. Exactly. So. We could just about do a show on uh, certain oil and, uh, and 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 proper oil and the proper uh, other items on there. Proper oil and antifreeze on a car. That's right. Okay, and we. Uh, oh, Bo has a question. Yeah. On. You say check the antifreeze. Um, how do you do that at home if you want to do it there? Do they still make those little units where you suck it up and it has the floating balls in there? They do, yeah. I believe and how called. accurate is that? That's a very good uh, question. We, we do use those typically on the, our uh, oil changes so that we can tell what the protection level is. I feel like that's a very good test. I believe that's called a refractometer. I think that's well, correct. Well, the refractometer is a different item to where you actually look through a little glass, and it's a lot more advanced way of testing. Yeah, it's the, an advanced the sounding word. Level. This is uh, this is just a coolant protection level gauge, and it just determines the number that's of right. balls that float uh, that float that in the item. And uh, for instance, it'll have a little chart, and if right. you float four balls, then you're good for 20 below zero. Two right. might be uh, 10 degrees above. Uh, so. That's that works very well because you can actually see the coolant, yeah. and you can also measure. Uh, if you wanted to really get technical, you could go. You you could use a refractor. Okay, there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that is something that a person can do at home. Uh, Want to mention also though is if you do not take a radiator cap off a vehicle that is warm, and even if the vehicle is cooled down. Make, Make sure, sure you do it, it very slowly out. and release pressure. Good idea to put a rag on top of that cap, yep, too. Put a rag on it because sometimes, even though they may not be hot, they still may be under pressure. Right. Uh, so be real careful. Okay, we are ready for the next question. Okay, I'm going to give you a question, and then I'm going to give y'all a tech tip. Okay. Oh. Quiz. <laughs> That's a ready? good idea. I like okay. that. Okay. Uh -huh. The question is, how long do spark plugs last? And then my tech tip is, how many spark plugs are there? Well, Okay. <laughs> We can uh, we can do that. 
All right. So, uh, you know, it does seem like most vehicles uh, kind of range. Uh, some of the Chrysler vehicles as early as 30,000 miles. Some of the imports as high as 120. Mm -hmm. um, so it does depend on your vehicle as far as the spark plugs um, and what their set interval is. There's several different types of plugs. There's copper core plugs. There's iridium tip plug, nic nickel nickel. Uh, plugs. I mean, there's so many of them yeah. that it kind of depends on what type of spark plugs you have. Um, so, would you say that's a pretty good generic uh, answer on that? Yeah, I, I would. And, and of course, some of the better ways to find out when yours are due to be changed is by your owner's manual. But also, I would recommend consulting your service advisor because a lot of different vehicles, they may have a different engine or list different engines in your owner's manual. And one may say to replace the plugs at, at a certain time in a different engine may be at a totally different mileage. Right. Uh, so also consult your service advisor. Uh, but, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it used to be 30,000 miles on Just cars. Just cut and dry, Almost yeah. all the cars. And you'd be lucky if they would last that. <laughs> right. Uh, but now, uh, then they come out with the uh, single-tip platinum, which moved it up to 60,000 miles. And then the double-tip platinum, yep. uh, which it moved out. it up yep. to 90,000 miles. And then the iridium, yeah. and uh, and then all the other metals that they use, and it's not uncommon at all to see uh, 100,000, 110,000 right. down cars. But because of that, it gets overlooked a lot of times because it it's yeah. such a long uh, time between uh, between changes. Yeah. Till some people say, "Oh, it's been 125, 30,000 miles, and my plugs haven't been changed." Well, the car will still run good. But there's a chance that those plugs might be frozen in there. They may break when you try to take them out. And that's or, a nightmare. Or, of course, they can take a coil or some other ignition component, component out, uh, yeah. out with it when it does finally go out. So that's you do right. want to be careful to make sure they changed on time. we got time for another question real quick. Well, what about, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we what about the answer to my tech tip? Oh, the oh answer. yeah, there oh, we go. Okay, great. All right. Um, I would say that depends on the size yeah. engine. Of course, if you have a... Uh, a four-cylinder engine, you would have. Well, it, that don't always apply either, because some four-cylinder engines, there's a few that have that eight have plugs. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, that's not right. a lot of them, but there's a few. Uh, but normally, you would have one plug per cylinder. So if you have a V6, you would have six spark plugs. V8, uh, eight spark plugs. Unless it's a Hemi, then you yep. have two plugs per cylinder. Yeah, exactly. So it does vary a little bit. Uh, so I would say the answer to that would be. Uh, commonly one plug per cylinder, but talk to your service advisor to make sure that there's So not did we a get it? I think he's a winner, Jr. I was going to say, because we can control the class anyway. Jr. will you please tell Aaron <laughs> what he's won? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I get nothing. That's Wait, right. I think we're going to need yep, to take a real quick break. break. Uh, we won't have time for another one, another question, but we will have time as soon as we return right after this message. Clements and John One. Ryan Mooney. Y'all are up. Little GTO, you're really looking fine. Three deuces and a four speed and a 389. Listen to it, tacking up now. Listen to it. And welcome back to the CNC Auto Show, and we are in the power hour. We are answering frequently asked questions. I think you like to say that. I do. It sounds really neat. <laughs> kind of builds everything up and gives it a lot of suspense. I don't know what that was, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are ready to go to the next question. Okay, how often should I change my timing belt? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, it is. Very good question. Yeah, we actually were talking to Bo last week. I think he had a problem with the time belt, or his son did. Yeah. It uh, it didn't want to stay together. It broke. Yeah. <laughs> and on some cars, when they break, it can be catastrophic. It can. It absolutely can. The, uh, the valve and the piston at one time occupy the same space. Yep. And, of course, typically either the valve bends, that's the most common, yeah. or the they valve. And when it breaks, they occupy it at the same time. That's right. Exactly. Same space, Not same pretty. time. <laughs> yeah. um, so it can turn a, a perfectly good running engine into um, a boat anchor. Yeah. Uh, tie simply a string because to it, take it fishing. And yeah, exactly. Dump it right down in the water to hold you still. So it, it, there again, it falls in, in lines with what vehicle you have. Um, some vehicles, I can't believe it, but some of them were 30,000 miles at some times. 
Um, some of them were 60,000 miles, some of the Mitsubishi. Yeah, I commonly remember 60 as being when they first come out. I barely, barely remember some at 30. Nah, the, but th- there was the Mitsubishi Raider that was 30. Yeah, 60. Yep, and, 60, they were, and it was true. At 60, they would break. Sure yeah, they would. They really would. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they went, I would say the, the most common is right around 100, whether it be yeah. 90 or 120, somewhere in that range. Um, but normally 100,000 miles. Is they started making the, the rubber better, the designs better. And they did. And just in, increased the intervals on when right. they would be changed. But that's another one of the services that because it's so long. Yeah, exactly. It, it gets forgotten somehow. It does. You come around 200,000 and you've got a perfectly good running vehicle. It's been treating you well. You've kept all the maintenance up. And like you mentioned, you <laughs> forgot that that service is due. And then you just destroyed that engine because, yeah. of course, it was forgotten. Especially, let's say, if you bought the car at 80,000 miles. Great right. car. You love it. You've been driving it. Uh, timing belt's the furthest thing from your mind because you didn't buy the car new and you right. just you might assume that somebody probably had it done. Uh, well, it might have been due at 100,000 miles. Well, you get 110, 120,000 miles riding down the road. On a timing belt, everything can, in most cases, mm-hmm. will run absolutely perfect up until the time it just poosh. Yep, it's just like somebody pulled quits. the key out. And when it's an interference engine, those parts that we talked about before collide. Yeah. And then you have major damage that could turn something into you could have easily went another 100,000 miles without any issues at all right. to a vehicle that's going to need major work done to it. That's right. And I think that mile. same scenario is very important, too, a little bit different mileage. If Say if you buy a vehicle with 120, 150 or something like that on it mm-hmm. uh, and you just purchased it, you really, really, really want to find out if that time belt has been done mm-hmm. uh, simply because – at that point, if you buy it that interval, it's already overdue right. if it has not. So, of course, you have this beautiful vehicle. You just got it and everything, and you want to be absolutely sure that that service yeah. has been That's completed. That's one of the best benefits of a pre-purchase inspection. In most cases, things like that would, would be caught. That's right. Because you may have budgeted for this car. You might say, well, I'm going to spend a little bit more than I want to spend, but this is a beautiful car. Yep. And, uh, Tires, and tray, everything else. Yeah. for a period of time to spend, so I'm going to go ahead and buy this car. Right. Well, you buy it, and on some cars, if you do all the things that need to be done with that car when you buy it, mm-hmm. when you do a time and belt job, uh, for instance, replacing the pulleys that need to be replaced, the water replacing pump, the water the pump, a uh, good time to go ahead and change the coolant, uh, and you have tensioners and all the things that need to be done at the same time. I see it run anywhere from six fifty to twelve fifty, depending right. on the vehicle. Right. And that can add a lot to your budget if you wasn't expecting it. Exactly. And and to uh, not that used cars are bad buys because of course every vehicle I've ever owned was used, but a lot of times people are getting out of them because maybe a service like that's coming up, mm-hmm. and it, maybe the vehicle's not fitting their needs anymore. So that's that's like you mentioned the biggest thing on. Uh, Purchasing a used vehicle is having a good inspection to even yeah. find out if it has a time belt. Maybe and, it has a change. And if you don't get a pre-purchase inspection, find out if the vehicle does have a time and belt or not. Right. If it has been done or not. And then if it hadn't been done, have some method that you can use to find out uh, to, to flag you and say or remind you. Remind you. Time, That's right. Uh, to let you know that it's time. Okay? All right. All right. Okay, Aaron and Jr. will it hurt my engine if I drive it with a check engine light on? Mm, you first, you got to check and make sure it's there. That's what that light means, right? Yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, no, I think the answer to that question would be no, not necessarily. Uh, the biggest thing you want to watch for on a check engine light is if it's actually flashing. Uh, if the light is just on solid, you crank the vehicle up, it's on solid, you drive it, it's on solid. Normally that means there's an input that the computer doesn't like, whether it be an O2 sensor that may not be reading, a coolant temp sensor that not that's not reading. The car is smart enough to plug in a, a, a known good value in that mm-hmm. parameter, whichever one it's missing, so that it can, of course, keep going and, and driving mm-hmm. and whatnot. Now, it may not get the best fuel economy. It may not, you know, drive. I mean, of course, it's going to drive good, but it may not have the best performance. Yep. Um, but again, the biggest thing to watch for is when the engine is or the check engine light is actually blinking because that's indicating a misfire condition. And a misfire condition can cause a lot of damage um, to other components such Especially as... Especially the, the converter. Yeah, the converter. You'll just wipe that out. And, of course, that's one of the pricier things on a vehicle, mm-hmm. especially in the exhaust system. Uh, if it's misfiring, the check engine light will be blinking. And what that means is, of course, raw fuel going through the exhaust system, which can really and truthfully melt the converter down. That's the catalytic converter that is. Um, so I would say it's fine to drive. I would urge you to get it checked out as soon as possible, obviously. But don't ruin a trip. 
real yeah, cause of it. Exactly. Let's, let's say you're on a trip to the beach and you got the car loaded uh, full of the family and yep. everybody's on their way down there and then all of a sudden the light comes on. You don't want to. You, you don't need to turn around and come back. Right. Do monitor everything. And it's else. a good good idea that you go ahead and check the obvious. You know all your fluid levels and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, but you're right. Don't ruin a trip over it. Don't pull over on the side of the road or anything like that. It, it, it's still safe to drive. And then at your next stop, make sure to your, your gas cap's tight because that is one of the many things mm -hmm. that can cause it. But that's that's like one out of a thousand. Yeah. Uh, that can do it. If but it, it fixes it, you should buy a lottery ticket that day. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, I have kind of a two-part question with that. Um, uh -huh. For some of the newer cars, they have, like with mine, is it has, I guess it's OnStar. So right. uh -huh. they can do those diagnostic checks. How accurate? are that, those uh, uh, that's a great question um i really like that system you're right they can actually tell you what the trouble code is and what the potential causes are um so that is a good question because they can't technically diagnose it they can't right. pinpoint the problem simply because you know obviously you'd have to have a lot of equipment up hooked up to the vehicle but yes that's a great great idea you know you say you're traveling going to that beach trip aaron was mentioning the check engine light comes on you can use that feature and they'll say hey it's a p0301 or whatever it may be and they'll tell you the trouble code and in most cases they'll say yes you can continue drive it or you know try and get it into a service center okay. that's great awesome. yeah and of course that gives me an opportunity to mention also that if you're on the road and the check engine light comes on and or and you suspect something is there and you would like to talk to somebody you can go to NapaAutoCare.com and you can find a repair facility you can do a search of the area that you're in and pick out a shop and right. drive in. And I've had great success with telling our customers uh, to do just that, to right. uh, to go go to Napa Auto Care, and they say, yeah, I found one. They treated me really good. I've had great feedback over I did years. that very recently. A friend of mine actually drove to Las Vegas in his truck and mm -hmm. actually had some issues, so I did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Worked out good. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good feeling for us also to have somebody that we can refer uh, people to if they have a problem. Okay. Okay. We are ready. Our next question is, how often should I change my wiper blades? Oh, yeah, that's a good one, too. Yeah. Uh, when, you hear the, when you're on a trip and it's going, ee, 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 <laughs> and then you get to your trip and you're grouchy. Yeah. And, and, and the, the whole family's biting at each other and everybody's <laughs> upset. Yep, because they've been listening to that noise the whole time. Or the football game's ruined because everybody in the car that you were riding with is upset with each other. Yep, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> now you're right. Those, uh, of course, wiper blade being rubber, it can deteriorate, dry rot. It gets hard. Did that they don't good? clean. <laughs> I'm already ticked off. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, of course, you know, you want to inspect them. A uh, good time to do that is, uh, you know, if you can get it in your mind, every time you fill up, just kind of peek, peek at them. You know, that's what a lot of service centers used to do back in the day. So, uh, you know, that's a good time to do it. Um, but yeah, you want to look for, of course, the rubber, uh, whether it be, you know, separating from the blade assembly itself. Um, obviously you want to make sure they're wiping good. A lot of times, like Aaron mentioned, when they're, they're, they're making noise like that, that's because the rubber has become hard. Uh, if you ignore that and you're ticked off all the time, mm -hmm. <laughs> it can actually scratch your windshield. And of course, you know, the bad part is when oncoming traffic's coming at you at night, that the, the oncoming traffic's lights will actually kind of shine through those scratches. And, and a lot of times really uh, kind of stop your vision from seeing as far yeah. as it you know, once could, mainly because of those scratches. And then so, you, you know, a pair of $20 wiper blades, you know, cost you a three, $400 windshield, yeah. and that's a cheap one. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a good good question. Yeah, some of these windshields have uh, antennas and different rain, things, sensors, rain sensors, built in d defrost. Yeah, it, exactly. And it can cost a lot more money to replace a lot of windshields. So it is a real good idea to go ahead and uh, have those windshield wipers replaced. And plus, it makes the trips go so much smoother. That's right. John Ryan, we are up for another break. All right, let's go. All right, we're going to take another quick break. And as soon as we return, we have a lot more great questions that we'll be able to answer during the show. And so. We will be right back. That's right. Chairman Clements and One, John Ryan. Y'all are up. I've been driving all night, my hands wet on the wheel. There's a voice in my head that drives my heel. And we 
are back with you with the CNC Auto Show, and we are we are in the Power Hour. That's right. Like How about that. Hour of Power? Our, ooh, I like that too. <laughs> and we are taking frequently asked questions, and we have a good list of them, the ones that we have. And emails, uh, they, they come from different emails, people coming into the shop, uh, phone calls. Yeah. And we have we have been answering a lot of those already, and yep. we have a lot more that we want to answer. So we are ready to go to the next question. Okay, why are my brakes making noise? Because mm. they're make about a, to make a brake noise, John Ryan. I can't do it. Aaron. You do go it. Ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna make. No, that's not good. A little bit more. It's got to be a much higher pitch. But I'll make the grunting noise more of a when you put on brakes. You can uh, brakes can make a couple of different type noises. A squealing <laughs> noise, uh, mm -hmm. which I didn't do very well. A grunting let's, noise. Let's hear one more squeal. Yeah. Last time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that didn't work. All right, now they can make a they can make a squealing noise. <laughs> now there is a, um, a a thing called a brake squealer on the brake pads. Right. And a lot of people think that because they can hear this high pitched noise. Mm -hmm when they're not pressing the brake pedal, that right. it's probably not the brake. And then many times when you press the brake, that noise goes away. That's right. Well, that is a brake squealer. And they have that set up to where it will actually touch the rotor mm -hmm. before the grinding occurs. Right. So if you hear that for a long period of time, and then all of a sudden that squealing noise turns into a grinding noise when you're hitting the brake pedal, that means that you did go too far and right. you did cause some problems the squealer is warning your wallet mm -hmm. and then when it's gone it takes your wallet oh i like that <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna write that down the <laughs> so if you if if you address things like that early right and uh and and have the brakes checked and, and every time your brakes make a squealing noise don't necessarily mean that the brakes are bad right but if you continuously hear some yeah good consistent some, one yeah. some some noise like that have the brakes checked, but better yet is that each time you, each time you have the vehicle service for your regular uh, three months, three thousand mile, or five months, five thousand miles, or whatever service interval you use, right? Have them look at the brakes, just make sure. And, and yeah, because it can cases, be a lot of times, you know, minor sand or pebbles and stuff mm -hmm. like that can actually get in them, and it could be something like that causing that noise yeah. too. Or they can be crystallized, right? Uh, but they can also be due to be changed, and if you catch brake items early yeah uh it can help you to save a lot of money big time yeah so especially the cost of some of these rotors that you see mm -hmm. and then the uh labor that's involved in replacing them some of them just simply slide off of the hub yeah. some of them are actually bolted to the back side of it the yeah. entire wheel bearing spindle the whole nine yards yeah. has to come apart so then on top of that sometimes it, it costs even more when you have to replace your hood and your front fenders <laughs> yeah <laughs> as a result of no brakes yeah okay we're ready for the next question Okay, the next question is, and if you're watching Facebook Live, you'll see this girl is not getting a facial. She's <laughs> wanting to know, what does she do when her car overheats? Go get a facial. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a picture of the steam coming out of the hood, right. and it is uh, blowing onto the girl's face. That's right. Uh, yeah, that's a good question, of course. Obviously, that means that the, there is a, a either a leak or the system is obviously overheating. Um, most of the time when the steam is coming out, that's because it's overheated or there is, of course, coolant getting on something hot. Mm -hmm. um, the best thing to do, of course, would be definitely do not open the radiator cap because it, in some cases, can, you know, of course, shoot off. And, of course, coolant's right behind that can burn you very, very badly. Mm -hmm. uh, so the best thing to do is, you know, get the vehicle into a safe location, let the vehicle cool. Uh, I would say at least for an absolute minimum of 30 minutes because, you know, once they're overheated, probably, heated, longer. Yep. probably longer would be good. Um, and then, you know, of course, let it set, pull the radiator cap off, use every precaution you can. A good tip, too, is to squeeze the whichever hose you can actually visibly see mm -hmm. and see if it's under pressure. Obviously, if it's under pressure, it will feel hard and firm, similar to a car tire. If it does not have pressure on it, you should be able to just about touch your yeah. fingers together uh, with that hose. Um, hopefully, it does not have pressure. Check the coolant level. Most likely, it's going to be low because, again, it's yeah. most likely But overheated. I'd even let it cool off more before I poured coolant, coolant in absolutely, there. yeah. Because if you've got a, a really hot motor and you start pouring cold, cold water coolant inside yep. there, something can crack. Yep. And you can do even more damage just pouring more 
cooling in there. That's right. So, uh, but yeah, just let it sit as really and truthfully as long as possible before mm -hmm. you do anything. But most likely is it's going to need a repair, whether it be a radiator or a cracked hose. Uh, but there is other things electronically that it could be also. For instance, if the cooling fans are not coming on, uh, it could be something along those lines. But to answer your question, I guess if it's overheating, try and let it sit as long as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time you're going to need to have that vehicle towed into a facility where it could be repaired and uh, yeah. go from there. Yeah, if you drive one with it hot, uh, modern cars are made better than ever before. They right. last longer than ever before, more efficient, but they do not stand abuse such as running hot, yeah. uh, running low in oil. I would say water like and that. oil are the it really yeah. truthfully the only two things that it needs to run. Yeah, they just don't withstand items like that. Like old, car, old cars uh, used to have huge radiators, huge blocks, very thick blocks. Right. If they, uh, if they ran hot, you'd normally pour some more in and keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, newer cars, if it runs hot one time, you did some damage. And, and that's true. And, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of this vehicle we experienced at the shop. It ran so hot that the, the ABS plastic intake manifold actually melted and went mm -hmm. inside the cylinder heads. Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned, years ago, you know, everything was made out of steel. You could drive it and drive it and drive it. Matter of fact, you could drive it till it quit. It yeah. got so hot and pour cooling in it, crank it up and keep mm -hmm. going. But you go. cannot do that on today's vehicles. No, There's so many different things. Even vehicles with timing belts. We've seen timing belts literally melt off. Mm -hmm. The camshaft yeah. sprocket gets so hot that it will actually melt the timing belt. So. Yeah. so don't drive them when they're hot. Okay, next question. Okay, Aaron, do I need to take my car to the dealer for regular maintenance work in order to maintain my warranty? Um, no, no, absolutely not. Now, it, it, it is, a, it is a, a, if you have a good relationship with right. a dealership, there's great dealerships out there, there's great independents, there's yeah. great franchises. No reason to go um, to whoever you, you yeah, know, have it, a good If you've relationship got a, a dealership that you go to and you enjoy that relationship and you want to go th there, I think that's a really good thing to do that. Right. Uh, but if you communicate better with an independent or some other person, then they're, they're, it's actually against the law to force someone to, steer. to take a car right. to a, a dealership in order to keep your warranty in effect. So as long as the place that services the vehicle uh, keeps proper records... Uh, uses, if I'm not uh, mistaken, it has to be electronic records too, doesn't it? Um, well, you don't necessarily have to use electronic okay. records, but if you don't, it does get into a little bit of a sticky area because you have to save receipts. Right. For instance, if you change your own oil and you want to keep your warranty in, a, in, in effect, you have to save the receipts and save the dates. I would keep a journal. Uh, but if you carry to, uh, it to a regular place, uh, remember where you carry it to. If you carry it to different places, Remember those places because you, if you ever have to prove when your oil was changed, you, you want to do that. Right. But if you have a set place to go to and you, you've got a relationship with a, another shop, it's absolutely fine to do that from day one. And if that shop sees an item that should be a recall item or a warranty item, mm -hmm. that shop can tell you that this may be covered under warranty and you can take it there, have it covered, and then continue your relationship with right. your regular shop that you've had all the time. So absolutely not. You do not have to go to a dealer, even with a brand new car. Okay. So Aaron, before we close this hour out, just to follow up from that, um, people want to know if they're going to do the work, do they have to take it to the dealer? Okay. If they going to do the like the body work, repair, maybe if, any if, kind of work. Yeah. You're talking about doing the work theirself. Mm -hmm. No, it says when, when should I take, when should I take my car to a dealer for work? Okay. Oh, yeah. For like recalls and, and oh, stuff yeah, like that. Oh, yeah. Like if, if it's a recall item, then mm -hmm. uh, yes, you would need it to go to a dealer because they would be able to cover that no charge. The manufacturer would pay the dealer for that. Uh, or if you have a an item that's a warranty job right? Uh, that you would have done. Other than that, those are the only items that you would have to take a vehicle to the dealership for unless you want to and have that. Uh, that's that, right. Uh, communication and, and of course if them. it's if it's a free service why wouldn't you obviously exactly yeah so. there's nothing wrong as a matter of fact when someone comes here we let them know that they can do that that's John right. Ryan, we are all out of time this was fun i like this yeah it was it was it was a lot of fun and it is uh but it's time to go and we're on e for now and we will be back uh with more of power, of power hour, hour.